and welcome. This is Success Stories. I'm your host, Alan Mendenhall. Success Stories is a program of the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University that highlights the lives and careers of people who have accomplished great things. Judge William H. Pryor, Jr., Bill Pryor, known to most of you, is one of those people. He is a chief judge of the 11th uh, Circuit Court of Appeals for the United States of America, former attorney general in the state of Alabama, and he is my guest today. Judge Pryor, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Well, it's really good to have you. I want to start with law school because you and I had a conversation recently about law school and what students are learning these days, and, uh, and I happen to know that you were a very uh, energetic law student. You were fascinated with the material, Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of law students today go, go to law school because they don't know what else to do. But you are not that person. You are uh, uh, enthusiastic about the material. You really wanted to be a lawyer. And so I want to start with, uh, with the law school experience for you and what that was like and why you took an interest in the law to begin with. Well, I'll back up a moment and explain why I went to law school because I think that might help uh, explain why I loved it so much. Um, I was the oldest of four kids um, who grew up in Mobile, and our parents were Catholic school teachers, and um, my father was the band director at our high school. And everyone said, uh, because in my house, playing an instrument was an obligation, <laughs> a duty. It wasn't a choice. Uh, and I, I was a percussionist. I, had, uh, I did well in music. Uh, and everyone said, oh, you should be like your dad, go off um, and, and become a band director, become a musician. And uh, as much as I loved music, um, I had doubts about that from the beginning and thought that in high school, at least, I really loved history and English. When I got to college, um, my freshman year was 1980. Ronald Reagan was running for president. I was a big fan of uh, President Reagan and joined the college Republicans and started college as a music major, chose the college I attended based on that, uh, had a band and uh, music scholarship. Uh, but after my freshman year, figured out that's not what I wanted to do with my life and, uh, and thought hard about what I wanted to do and, and settled on a pre-law curriculum, which was a scary thing because a liberal arts curriculum is one that Will, will train you to think well, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you a good job. Uh, and so um, I knew that if I was going to go to law school, I needed to really think hard about that and prepare seriously for it. And uh, the, the college I uh, attended actually had a pretty good pre-law curriculum. I thought about whether I should go to a different college, but it, uh, they had given me good academic scholarships as well. and. And so um, I took that, that time in college to think seriously and prepare and worked at a couple of different kinds of law firms, uh, one in the summer uh, uh, between my um, junior and senior year. Uh, I took a practicum in legal studies in college that placed me in an insurance defense firm where I, yeah, I really got an opportunity to see what lawyers do, go to court, uh, see the different kinds of lawyers, and by the time I arrived at law school, I had a pretty good understanding. I'd worked at three different law firms, and uh, I, I not only knew that I wanted to be a lawyer, but I also knew kind of what kind of lawyer I wanted uh, to be, and um, that really helped. Uh, I really had thought long and hard about this, and uh, and though I was kind of intimidated um, by the law school experience because so many of my classmates were really bright and had gone to really prestigious schools. Uh, I, I took it uh, a, a humble attitude and just uh, decided I was going to outwork everybody uh, and, and really um, buckle down and treat it like a job. Get up every morning and read my cases and go to class and, and then at night after, after dinner, read until I had to go to sleep. <laughs> and uh, my, my eyeglass prescription that I'd, I wore my first eyeglasses in college, a really weak prescription, 
but that prescription doubled every year of law school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a lot about your public life when you were, uh, of course, Attorney General of Alabama, and of course you've been a well-known federal judge for a long time, but I really don't know much about uh, your period in private practice and, and what you did in private practice. So I, I um, my first job after law school was clerking for Judge Wisdom, uh, for John Minor Wisdom on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Um, the courthouse in New Orleans is now the John Minor Wisdom Courthouse. So he was a legendary judge. It was a great job. Uh, it was also, working for him was the first time where, where I really started thinking seriously that someday I might want to be a judge. But I was, I was set on uh, returning, um, hopefully, to Alabama. I, I, I did think about practicing in New Orleans, but I, the firms that I was interested in working for represented uh, American business. Uh, I thought, in many ways, um, the civil uh, law system in our country, uh, litigation, uh, was, was undermining free enterprise um, that lawsuits had become uh, a form of, uh, an abusive form of, you know, jackpot justice, uh, and that um, we, we need the legal system to make sure that people who have been harmed um, in society and in the workplace uh, where, it, where it was a wrongful harm, uh, that they're, they're compensated justly and, uh, and, that, and they're treated fairly. Um, but equal justice is, uh, when we take an oath as a judge, we do, do we promise to do equal justice to the poor and to the rich. Uh, and equal justice is not only equal justice for an injured worker or a consumer, but it's also equal justice for rich and powerful corporations. And, um, and I didn't think they were getting equal justice, so I was really committed to being a commercial defense lawyer, um, to representing uh, a lot of risk takers and entrepreneurs who were creating jobs and uh, who I thought uh, ought to be defended. And so uh, I went to Birmingham after my clerkship and, and worked um, at one of the oldest firms in the state, maybe the oldest firm, the Cavanaugh Johnston firm. Uh, after a few years there, that firm split and many of the lawyers formed a new firm. I went with that, those lawyers to help form that firm. Um, what is now the 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 office for Jones Walker, which is a big New Orleans firm, but back then our firm was Walston Stabler, um, and um, I was about to become a partner. I was a, only a couple of months away from becoming a partner when Jeff Sessions was elected Attorney General and asked me if I would be his top civil deputy. And so it, it, instead of being a junior partner at our law firm, I would become the top civil and constitutional lawyer for the state and would be uh, the main lawyer for the state of Alabama defending voting rights and, uh, and other civil rights cases in state and federal courts. And that was a, um, a pretty attractive offer. So I accepted it and came to Montgomery to serve as his deputy attorney general. Now, am I correct that you were appointed to Attorney General and then ran twice and were elected twice? Is that, is that, that correct? That's right. So when Jeff Sessions was elected to the United States Senate two years after he was elected Attorney General, Governor Fob James uh, appointed me to finish his term. Uh, and then I ran for my first election in 1988. and. Uh, that was a, a tough night for a lot of Republicans, but I, um, back then I was a Republican. I, I survived the night. And when I say back then I was a Republican, today I'm, I, I don't have a party. I'm a federal judge, so I'm thankfully out of politics. But, um, but um, I won in 1998 a close election, uh, and then in 2002 uh, won re-election. And how did you like the campaign life compared to what you do now? Well, compared to what I do now, uh, I, look, th what I do now is a lot better. Uh, I, I loved being attorney general, uh, and I was young. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know what could yet what could not be done, uh, and there's some idealism that comes with youth. And I think that it was um, helpful as a state attorney general um, to be idealistic and and vigorous, young. 
uh, I think it made uh, being attorney general uh, exciting. And, and you were and, the and youngest, right? The youngest. At, I was at the, the time. youngest in the in the United States at that time when I first became attorney general. Um, Mark Pryor, a couple of years later, became the attorney general of uh, Arkansas, and he was nine months younger, so he displaced me. Uh, we had the same last name, though we were not related, but when we were in meetings together, we referred to each other as, as cuz. Because <laughs> uh, everyone from the rest of the country thought Alabama, Arkansas, both have the last, same last name, they, all Southerners, they must be related. Uh, <laughs> we weren't. Uh, but, um, but yeah, um, I, um, I, I was pretty young, uh, and, and at that time, there was there was a fun side to campaigning um, and to uh, public speaking and getting out and meeting uh, the voters. But but I had a young family too. Our daughters were young, uh, and balancing it all was um, challenging. I, I took the girls um, to school every morning, and my spouse uh, would pick them up at the end of the day. Uh, but you know you, you had to really be. Uh, disciplined about your schedule to make sure that you were doing justice to your family and to r raising your children, being a good father and husband. But you must still be very disciplined with your schedule because you produce a lot of work. You give speeches, you write for law reviews, you produce articles, you've written for uh, numerous law reviews, but also for, for example, the New York Times or the USA Today. How do you manage to uh, produce so much while sitting as a judge? Well, I don't have a life. <laughs> I, um, I love to work. Um, I also have um, had really talented um, assistants who can help me. Uh, you've got to know how to delegate and, while still doing, being in charge and, and, and of the final product. Uh, I've had a really talented group of law clerks over the years. Um, every year I bring in a whole new crowd. In fact, I've already got two new law clerks who recently came on, and I've got a few more who, by, by Labor Day, the whole crew will be on board. And uh, for, for how many years in advance for, is that? They, they, well, they only clerk for me a year at a time. I hire them probably at least two or three two years yeah, in advance. Wow. Yeah, uh, and and that, that's that's helpful in producing the volume of work. I'm obviously. Um, I have a lot of opinions I have to write, and uh, and I've got a pretty rigorous process for how we we go about that. Uh, and the law clerks are instrumental in helping me uh, accomplish it. Um, but they they help me too with uh, with some of my extracurricular curric legal writing. Um, they're they're mainly focused, of course, on the judicial work. Well, I'm glad you brought up the clerks because I was going to ask about the way you do your clerkships. You sort of famously have clerks come in for one term, or maybe maybe at most two terms. Well, always Just one. Always one. Always but I one. knew they they rotated out. Um, but a lot of your clerks go on to uh, high positions. They clerk for Supreme Court justices, or they they become solicitors general, like Eddie Lacour is the solicitor general of our state, and he was one of your clerks. Um, what is what what is it about that mentorship process that is meaningful to you because you've become sort of famous as a mentor to young attorneys well it goes back to my clerkship uh, judge wisdom was a tremendous mentor and had a very tight network of law clerks uh, and he developed it he worked on it and i learned a lot from him uh, about how to do that um, his law clerks would meet regularly uh, for reunions in New Orleans. New Orleans is an easy place to get everyone to come back for, um, for a weekend. Um, and uh, it, in conjunction with meetings of the American Law Institute uh, ordinarily in Washington, he would also gather a lot of his clerks who were members of the Institute. Uh, and that, that would happen, you know, every, every couple of years. Um, and so between those two sets of reunions, they really got to know each other. And he, he, he made sure that, um, that law clerks did know each other, that former clerks knew current clerks and, and future clerks, and, and uh, it, he really established a network. And I've tried to do the same thing. Um, my clerks help each other. I help them. Um, I've been fortunate to have some, some great clerks who have gone on to uh, more success. That's that's really attributable to them, um, but I hope I've helped them along the way. Um, four of my clerks are now federal judges. Um, two, two of the 
clerks are on state supreme courts. Um, one of them, one of those judges is, is on my court now. Uh, one of my former law clerks. Um, he and he was previously. It's Andrew Brasher. He was previously the Solicitor General of Alabama. Some of them have worked in the White House. Uh, you know, so uh, one of them is the U.S. Attorney in Birmingham. Uh, and some of those law clerks I've taught. Um, I've taught at the University of Alabama Law School uh, and at Cumberland, um, and particularly at Alabama, I've, I've had some uh, really fine uh, law clerks who have then gone on to do other things like be the U.S. Attorney in Birmingham. And do you enjoy teaching in the classroom? I love um, teaching, yeah. Um, I t it, when I was a young lawyer in Birmingham at, um, at Cabinets Johnston at Walston Stabler, uh, they allowed me to teach as an adjunct uh, at Cumberland. I taught Admiralty which was um, something I learned a lot about at Tulane and where I had some expertise, but I wasn't getting to practice it much in, uh, in, uh, in Birmingham. So I taught it instead. Uh, and then after I became a judge, then Dean Randall at Alabama uh, asked me if I would teach, it, uh, teach federal jurisdiction, federal courts at, um, at the law school. And uh, I did, that's a rigorous course. I've always tried to teach classes that help me become a better judge, that make me better at what I do. Uh, and teaching federal courts for several years did that. And then I, I started teaching a, a course in statutory interpretation that was more of a seminar on textualism, on Justice Scalia's methodology. And uh, I taught it at Cumberland, and then I taught it at Alabama. And uh, I think that's made me a better judge as well. Well, would you mind talking a little bit about how your faith and your family have made you who you are as a person, not as a judge, but just as a person? Well, of course, my, my parents um, gave me my faith, um, and um, that's the greatest thing besides uh, that and discipline were the greatest gifts they ever gave me. Um, and, um, and, it's, and that has shaped my worldview about everything. Um, I, I view work really as a form of prayer. Um, I'm Catholic, so uh, might not surprise people that you know we think works really matter. <laughs> and, and so, in some ways, I view work as redemptive. It's sh sharing in the sufferings of Christ, uh, and um, and uh, it shapes my my view of everything. It shapes my view of my judicial oath, my obligation to follow the law, whether I agree with the law or not. I have an obligation. To obey the government and its laws, uh, and I, I try to take that obligation and my oath uh, seriously. And of course, it it, um, it it shapes my perspective about being a uh, a husband and a father, um, and just being a citizen and a friend. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it shapes everything about my my worldview. Well, this show is designed principally to reach young people, college students, uh, young professionals people who are still considering where their career path may lead. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have um, advice for somebody that's, say, early 20s and is unsure about what he or she would like to do for a career. Well, I, I would say you, you ought to t take a critical self-assessment of what you're good at. <laughs> God blesses us with different talents. Uh, some people are better at some things than others. My, I have a sister who's a, who's a physician. She's a pediatric cardiologist. Um, and when she went to Tulane Medical School and I was at Tulane Law School, and uh, we shared an apartment together. And I think we would both agree she would not have made nearly as good a lawyer as I do, as I did. <laughs> and I wouldn't have made a very good doctor. <laughs> so uh, we had different interests, uh, really, from the beginning. And, uh, and, you know, I had to overcome what everyone else thought I should do, um, that, that, that peer pressure that really comes with that. Everyone thought I should follow in my father's footsteps and be a band director. And as much as I loved my father and as great a role model and mentor as he was for me, that's not where I, I needed uh, to go. And, uh, and that was really not. I think what um, God wanted me to do with my life. Um, and 
the love that I had for writing, the love that I had for American history and for political science uh, really is what led me into law. And I think you ought to enjoy what, you're, what you do. I think you ought to go to work every day and, and, and enjoy your work, be proud of your work. And I think a lot of enjoyment comes from picking a vocation that really utilizes the talents that God gave you. And so you've got to be critical. You've got to know what you're really talented at and what you're not. Um, and you're going to be frustrated if you pick something that, that really doesn't develop the best talents that God gave you. Um, you you've got to be willing to, to put aside maybe what you would like for yourself to be and be more honest about what your actual talents are. I think that's very, very sound advice. Uh, you mentioned writing, and you admire good writing. I know you admire good writing, and you are known as a good writer. I think you've won um, some uh, a legal award on on good writing. It's the uh, um, what 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 was that award? I know you've won an award. Uh, well, for, 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 yeah. For, so for there's a journal. Uh, there's a journal. What is called an entertaining journal of law that um, it's published in Washington called the Green bag uh, and ah. they, they they do an annual survey of legal writing and and give awards um, and I, I, I won one of their awards a lot of judges have won that award but um yeah I do think writing is um, the most important skill of a lawyer and the most important skill of a judge uh, we communicate through our opinions lawyers communi communicate in their briefs and their written work it, they do get an opportunity to communicate with us sometimes in oral arguments, um, but sometimes that's because the legal writing in their briefs failed. <laughs> they failed to explain to us how we ought to decide their case in a way that we could easily figure out. And so sometimes, sometimes oral argument, sometimes it's a reflection of the importance of the case and the difficulty of the case, but sometimes it's a reflection of a, a failure in legal writing that uh, we need more help from the lawyers than we're getting from them and their briefs. Um, so writing is a Im really important skill and the most critical skill of, for any lawyer, I think. And you're never finished in your work in becoming a better writer. I, n I never feel like I have arrived as a good writer. Writing is really hard. Uh, it's not always <laughs> enjoyable uh, because you have to, again, be critical in your self-assessment, edit yourself repeatedly hone your work, um, show it to others. And you know, that, that's one of the values of my law clerks. My law clerks and I edit each other continuously before I circulate anything to any other judge for them to sign on because I want to polish my writing uh, in, a, in a way that is persuasive and understandable. Well, you served on the U.S. Sentencing Commission uh, from 2013 to, to 2018 and you were acting chair in 2017, 2018. What did that work involve? Well, that established um, sentencing policy for federal criminal cases. Um, and during the Reagan administration, Congress passed a law called the Sentencing Reform Act that required federal judges um, to bring some order and predictability to criminal sentencing in a wide variety of cases, whether it's federal criminal fraud or drug trafficking or immigration, those are some of the biggest um, categories. Firearms offenses, those are a huge percentage of, th those few categories are a huge percentage of federal cases. But, but the, there are thousands of federal criminal laws with punishments all over the books and judges were giving different kinds of sentences to the same people uh, depending on which judge sentenced them. And we wanted to bring more order to that. And so Congress required created a sentencing commission to um, publish periodically federal sentencing guidelines to regulate that process and to bring and to ensure that that criminal offenders in the federal sentence that the system were that similar offenders were getting similar punishments based on similar crimes uh, and and that would still take in, into account individual differences but but try to make sure that you know, consistent with equal justice under the law, that there was some predictability and order um, to federal criminal sentencing. And so the federal um, sentencing guidelines are the custodian, the, the sentencing commission is the custodian of them. 
and always um, works on them to make sure that they're reflecting the best practices in sentencing policy, that they're keeping up with the latest laws that Congress passes, and that they're respected by uh, federal judges. So uh, we have an elaborate uh, process, administrative law process, that the Sentencing Commission uses to promulgate those guidelines and amend those guidelines, update the guidelines, and that's what the work of the Sentencing Commission was and, and is. Well, I'll just ask one more question, and I'll have to do this as a thought experiment. If you were to go back to your 18-year-old self again, is there anything you would do differently? You know, I, I would like to think that I would, um, if, I, if I knew then what I know now, uh, that I would be more serious about some things um, and, you know, I would avoid some trouble that I got in as a, as a, as a, uh, as a kid. Everybody uh, has things they, they would like to do over again. But I don't think that I would choose a different vocation. Uh, I think um, I, I've been very blessed and, and fortunate. Uh, I, I hate that, that kind of thought experiment because I think sometimes that I've been lucky. Uh, and if I were to go back and do it over again, I wouldn't be as lucky the next time. <laughs> and maybe the best thing to do is to be satisfied with the blessings God has given me. Well, our state and our country have also been blessed by your good work, and so thank you for it. This has been Success Stories, a program of the Sorrell College of Business. This is Alan Mendenhall signing off. My, judge, uh, my uh, guest today was Judge William H. Pryor. Thank you very much. Until next time. Thank you.